Fanatical as Jin Myon was, his faith had diminished, leading Lee Jun to suspect that something very serious had occurred. Thinking this, he went straight to the main issue. Is today's meeting about faith? Caught off guard by the accurate guest, Jin Myung did not hide it and snapped his fingers to conjure a swirling water barrier above his head, an auditory shield skill borrowed from pisses. This skill allowed both of them to talk freely without being overheard. While John was marveling at the impressive skill, he took out the dagger he had given to Myung, focusing intently as Myung said he had read the memories lingering inside the dagger. The results indicated that the culprit who stabbed Lee Jun at Demon Falls was none other than the Saint of Virgo, the one of Jin Myon serve Kevin Ajar. A few hours before leaving Hugo Otter's house, John had instructed Larry Queen to investigate why Sung Jae was so adamant about being a disciple of Gemini. Previously, due to a loss of faith, he had been tortured painfully by Freja, so there must be a significant reason for him to remain in this celestial body. He assigned Larry Queen the additional task of finding out about the celestial body's secretary before he left. At the vacant house, the only sound came from the Fairy Queen, who was playing a game. Aiming to ask Yang Wai about the secretary, he instead decided to learn more about Sung Jae. Just then, Sung Jae arrived to seek help from Larry Queen. Larry's inner self wanted to jump for joy because it was the right person at the right time, but on the outside, she maintained her composure, continued playing the game, and asked, Spit it out if you have something to say. The boy got straight to the point, hanging away from the Gemini Magic Library to the secret library. That was the highest level of the Gemini Magic Library, where many forbidden spells were concealed, accessible only to high-level disciples. With the title of A-level disciple like Sung Jae, he should have been able to enter the library, but he had thrown away the Celestial Body Badge himself. Moreover, A-level did not have enough authority to enter the secret library. After seeking help, Sung Jae bowed to Larry Queen. The girl pointed her fingers into the air and a wormhole opened up, revealing the bookshelves of the Gemini Library. Helping Sung Jae bypass the barrier to enter the library was not difficult, but Larry Queen took the opportunity to ask why he wanted to enter the secret library, a place that stored forbidden spells and lost secret arts. Hesitating for a few seconds, Sung Jae finally decided to speak. I want to find a skill of soul summoning, which allows the summoning of life from the other side. Jalen, dressed entirely in black, sat still on a bench in the fog-filled city. He nervously recalled what Jin Myung had said earlier. According to records from a few years ago, similar daggers were often auctioned publicly and always appraised by my predecessor. Jin Myung believed that his predecessor had sensed the dark energy on the dagger and had tried to trace its origins even before him. First of all, it was confirmed that this dagger indeed belonged to Virgo, or more precisely, it was one of the many weapons in Virgo's arsenal. Therefore, Myung pulled out an old photograph and said, I think that displaying and auctioning it off is just a way to slowly and discreetly destroy the traces of the dagger. If my predecessor were still alive, he would have come to ask, but he was abruptly murdered while investigating the dagger's origins. Moreover, he was stabbed by it. Using his skills, Miao knew that someone had tried to erase the dark energy and create an extremely powerful curse. Although the curse was fading over time, it was clear that it was created to counter the powers of beings like Li Zhen. The curse was so strong that it could harm not only saints, but also the supreme gods. Jin pondered this conclusion, tossing around the idea of trying to contact Jin Lui, a practitioner of cursed magic, but dismissed it. No matter how competent he is, Jin Lui cannot create supreme divine curses. This dark energy did not originate from a deity, and the power of cancer was nothing compared to the energy within that dagger. The origin of the Calamites still remains a mystery. Jin speculates that the person who attacked him has a connection to the dark side of the earth, but that is just a personal conjecture. He rubs his forehead in frustration and shifts his focus to the time-limited experimental tasks. After that, he will deal with Virgo, a plan he has been preparing for a long time. The train announcement pulls Lee Jun back to reality. He eagerly watches the steam locomotive puffing its way closer before it comes to a halt. The shoes of the apostles step out of the first train car. Among the regular crowd, those dressed in uniforms like hunters moving in groups exude a distinct aura that makes everyone look back. A group of more than ten apostles lines up waiting. The last person appears amidst the buzzing discussions of the spectators. Lee Jian seems to have been waiting for that person. Upon seeing him, he breaks into his characteristic smile. The entire elite unit of Sagittarius is present, but John waits for the blonde squat leader to share a few words. Behind the blue shield of Virgo, an area that has been occupied by Calamites for many years, the booming sound of various fire rounds strikes the wretched birds. Flames blaze high, followed by the thud of feathered corpses falling before their eyes. 
The group cheers as they take care of all the birds and then disperses, each attending to their own tasks. On the ground, various obstacles, especially the roots of some strange creature, were snagging at the soldier's legs, becoming a topic for Jen to strike up a conversation. He asked, This area is managed by the Virgo Celestial Body. Why are the Sagittarius troops appearing here? A frowning person replied, This is under Virgo's commission. The Sagittarius Celestial Body always accepts commissions to eliminate Calamites with their elite forces, just like mercenaries. Currently, Castellan has gone to meet with the European Union government to get a more detailed explanation of the situation. Jian raised his eyebrow, about to ask why these people were taking on a job without fully understanding the details. The military commander turned back and informed him that Hugo Otters accepted the mission as soon as he heard the story, because the subject is directly related to him. Looking serious, he asked, Jian, have you ever heard of the monster that craves the power of the gods known as Blood Fog? Hugo Otters arrived at the Calamites' response headquarters of the European Union Parliament, where he was immediately introduced to Blood Fog. This is a type of monster that likes to spread fog to devour nearby creatures and souls, and it's been appearing for 10 days now. Hugo Otters questioned, Why haven't you gathered the forces of the Holy Team to deal with it, and instead are quietly looking for someone to resolve this? The other person replied, Blood Fog has been declared eradicated by the diplomatic agency. How can we widely announce its appearance? Hugo Otters frowned and asked, Does the government still hold this stance, even though it has devoured more than 5,000 people? The person simply smiled helplessly and replied, The total number of casualties is just a number, nothing more and nothing less. Hugo Otters wanted to know why Virgo Castellan, Kevin Ajar, was not showing up and received a fairly reasonable answer. The Virgo side has mobilized forces several times, all at a high level or above, but all have perished due to the blood-red fog created by blood fog, which put everyone into an abnormal state and rendered them unable to resist. The Virgo celestial body is inherently focused on close combat, so it's no different from offering bait to monsters. Currently, Kevin Ajar is dealing with a red calamity in another area, so he can't return in time. After surveying many celestial body zodiac signs, they chose Sagittarius, known for its mercenary army, to avoid any issues related to interests or politics. Furthermore, everyone knows that Sagittarius is very close with Jun. The resolution of the calamity involving 100,000 arms in the Philippines had convinced them to invite Hugo Otters to handle this matter. That smile in Hugo Otters' eyes was all part of the Alliance's scheme to deceive and cover up the shortcomings of Kevin Ajar, an arrogant individual who stubbornly refused to seek help from other forces to resolve issues in his own sanctuary. Hugo Otters leaned towards another hypothesis. Could it be that the Virgo celestial body intended to use blood fog to deal with Jun and himself? But his clenched hand on the chair showed his inner struggle. The bespectacled guy was anxiously watching as Hugo Otters told Kevin Ajar that Sagittarius and John weren't playing this game. He just laughed mockingly and said, Just emphasize blood fog, Hugo Otters won't be able to ignore it because that calamite harmed his lady. In the distant land of Belgium, the commander of the Sagittarius forces explained the same answer that made Hugo Otters determined to take on this mission. Jim crossed his arms, feeling confused. Who is this lady this guy is talking about? He slowly explained that it was Chun Ji Wu the wife of Castellan, and the mother of his two friends' little kids. The two met after Jian was imprisoned in the Demon Tower, so he had never seen his friend's wife. A girl interjected, to protect the lady and Sung Jae, the first saint of Sagittarius, celestial body, also met with misfortune. Jian knew who that was. It was Lee Jae Won, the kid who had been trailing behind him and his friend for the past 20 years. However, Jian himself was unaware of the reason his friend always hid whenever talking about his family. He had never seen blood fog and didn't know what that monster looked like, but its appearance clearly made Hugo Otters furious. Jian was confident he understood Hugo Otters' strength the best, since he had personally taught him how to fight. He couldn't believe that his friend could fall so easily. In ancient times, when the two were still battling, Hugo Otters was the only one allowed by Jian to fight back to back with him. Beyond absolute trust in the past, when mentioning the 12 celestial zodiac signs, Jian could firmly assert that his friend was the strongest among them. Thus, he ignored the children to hear more about what happened to Hugo Otters. Fortunately, he got consent. If it were someone else, they probably wouldn't have spoken, as the sagnari from ten years ago occurred on Sung Jae's seventh birthday. The red-haired boy was dozing off, waiting for his mother to talk with his father on the phone, bragging that he was about to successfully create a weapon to annihilate the great calamities. Such grand matters were just nonsense in the eyes of the child. Only when Ji Woo ruffled his son's hair, praising him for waking up early to go to the airport to pick up his mother, did Song Jae blink his eyes, showing signs of delight. Ja Won had risen early to take the young master to meet the lady. While chatting comfortably, Song Jae yawned widely and claimed he was hungry. 
Jian Wen took it upon himself to buy food for the young master. In the meantime, Song Jie noticed two strangers behind him who were trying to lower their voices, whispering to blame each other for releasing something outside, then hurriedly fled to escape death. But Song Jie was too young to understand and didn't tell his mother a word. The airport lights suddenly went out, causing Ji Wu to worry and quickly stand up to look around. The entire airport, so big, was plunged into darkness, leaving the passengers in confusion. Jai Wan and her child did not know what to do. The strange low rumble and the darkness made Jai Wan, who was buying food, rush outside to find Jai Wan and her child. His gaze immediately collided with a horrifying sight. The Calamites was staring directly at Jai Wan and her child, and no one was aware of it. While Jai Wan smiled and asked Jai Wan if something big was happening. The newly purchased food package fell to the floor with a thud. Jai Wan summoned all of his strength and lunged forward to save Ji Wan and her child from being thrown aside as the Calamites smashed through the door, his toothy mouth aimed at them. With all of his might, Jai Wan managed to push Jai Wan and her child away, but in return, he fell directly into the gaping maw of the Calamites. Sung Jae saw his dear uncle fall into the jaws of death, and he cried out loudly in his mother's arms, but he could do nothing. His vision could only see Ji Woo's lips and the image of his uncle, with nothing but a smile before falling into the drooling mouth, becoming one of the most horrific images of Sung Jae's childhood. Ja Won, in anguish, covered her son's eyes, trying to tell him not to look, but it was too late. Blood Fog looked like a frog that had just enjoyed a delicious meal, letting out a few satisfied croaks, terrifying the passengers and everyone present in the airport. The scene of the monster swallowing a person whole officially marked the beginning of an endless chaos. Seeing its tentacles wriggling as if looking for more to eat, the guards immediately contacted the Holy Council. Jad Wan and her son had barely touched down when they witnessed dozens of people being swept away by the tentacles. The space was engulfed in horrifying screams, drowning out Jai Wan's reminder to her son. No matter what happens, you must not let go of me. Chi Wan held on to Sung Jae, gritting her teeth and using all of her strength to run away from the reach of the extending tentacles. The vast airport soon transformed into a thick cloud of dust, filled with the sounds of desperate wails and motionless bodies that had their souls taken. Sung Jae's memories from the age of 7 to 17 could never forget the image of his mother with outstretched arms reminding him, Do not get out of the car until your father arrives. With tears in his eyes, young Sung Jae could not move, silently obeying his mother's words, waiting for his father to arrive. His mother looked so radiant then, yet tears were streaming down her face. A moment later, Sung Jae screamed until his throat was hoarse, but the monster still would not release his mother. Consumed by regret, Sung Jae only wanted to bring his mother back to celebrate a birthday together. It had been a long time since the family had been reunited. The boy cried endlessly, mumbling apologies. Soon enough, the tentacles had found their way to the car where the two of them were. Suddenly, golden light flickered in the overcast sky, blindingly bright. A fiery arrow shot down to the ground not far from the car, incinerating the tentacles. Hudo otters, his whole body ablaze, screamed, Sung Jae, are you okay? The boy, like a drowning man grasping a straw, leaned out to look at his father, who was still in his home clothes, barefoot. Taking advantage of the moment before the tentacles crawled closer, Hugo Otters turned and anxiously asked his son if he was hurt anywhere. But when he heard the word mother painfully escape his lips, he froze. Hugo Otters struggled to hold onto the bow, not wanting to let it fall, raising his helpless hand. He leaned against the window, trying to reassure his child and himself, for even Jia Wan might not survive. The swirling flames worn on the ground where Hugo Otters stood. Any tentacle that reached out was immediately incinerated to ashes. His eyes blazed with fury, his teeth gritted tight in anger. The Centaurus celestial body warred back, how dare you? Hugo Otters jumped high, surveying the sight of the huge, ugly Calamites, carrying on its back a gigantic tree filled with strange round masses. He guessed that those it had killed were trapped inside. Hugo Otters scanned everywhere and indeed found Ji Wu slumped among them. Rage burned fiercely in his heart, but he had to remind himself to stay calm to think of a way. Perhaps his wife was still alive. As long as he found a way to force her out, there was still hope. Hugo Otters landed on the head of the ugly Calamites, aiming directly at the spot where Ji Wu was trapped, putting all his strength into his empty hands, trying to separate the massive roots that were embracing his wife. Fire erupted around Hugo Otters' skin, who was eagerly wanting to save his wife, transferring into the plants and gradually reaching the brain of the blood fog, making it realize that someone was using different energy above it. Tentacles immediately appeared to disturb Hugo Otters. He angrily threw a spark of fire towards them, but suddenly hesitated when he saw two faces crying pitifully from that horrid mouth. The voices of the humans rang out, pleading for help. 
It moved closer to Hugo Otters, groaning and making him let his guard down for a moment. The Calamite's tentacle seized the opportunity, striking hard at Hugo Otters. He curled up and fell, while the monster's disgusting mouth broke into a gleeful smile. You are the one who received the power of the gods, so delectable. It drew humrily, sending dozens of tentacles into Hugo Otter's body, trying to suck out every piece of energy from the centaur. The pain from being drained of power made him scream in agony. Some Jay in the vehicle could not bear to witness this scene and shouted helplessly. Just then, another golden light appeared in the sky, descending directly onto the misbehaving Calamites. The ground around cracked, shooting debris into the sky. That energy continued to slam down, incinerating several tentacles that were holding Hugo Otters and also obliterating the gigantic plants, revealing bubbles containing the trapped humans inside. A voice rang out from above. Hey, Sagittarius, what's with this pitiful state? It was Hygen, shaping a sphere, speaking up to rescue everyone in the tree, descending alongside Stephen Maker and Yang Wai, who had a cigarette in his mouth, observing the situation below. Hugo Otters, weakly bracing himself on the ground, couldn't understand why these folks were here. The high-heeled foot of a wound landed heavily, as if answering the question. Scorpio St. Haley looked down at him coldly and asked, Are you okay? Then helped Hugo Otters to stand up. I heard there was a strong calamite, so I gathered everyone I could. They volunteered to help because no one wants blood fog to appear in their territory. In front of them were three saints in battle mode, clearly wanting to finish the fight quickly and head home to sleep. Hanjin kick up rocks and dirt, gathering them into a mass of energy. Yang Wai used his Jade Sovereign skill to summon a sharp sword, and Steven unleashed a thunderous punch directly at the crouching Calamites. But the confidence of all three vanished instantly, as if their power was entirely swallowed by the monster, even Hugo Otters, who witnessed it himself in shock for quite a while. The mouth of the monster closed, causing the three saints to retreat hurriedly, anxiously asking each other, What just happened? Did it just swallow the attack? Moreover, the wounds on its body healed at a rapid pace thanks to the energy it received. The monster's eyes were full of power as it rose up, shattering the ground. Steven shouted loudly at Hyjin, demanding that she immediately cast a barrier. She managed to do so just in time as the monster's tentacles aggressively attacked them. Hundreds of tentacles turned into sharp blades, rushing straight toward the saints, accompanied by the terrifying screech of the creature. It did not care who or what it hit, only wanting to level everything within reach. Hajin's eyes, nose, and mouth were streaming with blood from straining too much, her shield weakened from the monstrous assault of the Calamites. At that moment, the hand of the Libra Saint Lawrence released the scales of justice and activated the skill Golden Rules branches. The four of the saint materialized, a pair of scales appear above the monster, temporarily restraining it for a short time. As Morris appeared, she furrowed her brows and asked the three hovering above, Don't let the Calamites confuse you. She was someone who rarely socialized with others. Why Hajin was able to summon her was unclear to Lawrence, but the appearance of Libra was certainly not for leisure. Several vines wrapped tightly around the struggling Calamites, trying to pin it down to the ground and restrict its movements for a while. She turned to Hajin and said, Quick, use the teleportation technique to get this monster out of here. Can't you see how it devoured the attack just now? We can't win against it now, and it will drain our strength like it did with Sagittarius earlier. The sound of tearing vines echoed as the monster ripped through them. Sio quickly suggested, teleport the Calamites underground or into the lava flow, either way is fine. Gemini still hesitated, saying it will come back eventually. But Libra didn't care about that. Hugo Otter shouted, don't teleport it. This monster devours human souls. Those people are just empty shells. We need to defeat it and bring their souls back. Moreover, Chun Ji Wu is one of them. Sagittarius anxiously pleaded for everyone to help him bring down the monster. He panted heavily, but stubbornly insisted he could still fight. The wife he longed to see had not awoken yet. He could not give up hope. Lauren silently watched for a moment as if deep in thought, but just a few seconds later, the monster knocked away more vines. She had reached her limit and could hardly hold on any longer. So she shouted loudly toward Hygen, demanding her to use the teleportation technique immediately. Blood Fog opened its mouth wide and howled, preparing to attack again. Hygen had no choice but to use the teleportation skill as Lawrence instructed. Hugo Otters cried out in pain, No, stop. The only hope to save my wife is still there. But Hygen did not retract her skill. The energy in her hands flared up and the white light enveloped the entire body of the monster and successfully teleported it. That day, Hugo Otters afters was severely criticized. Only the saints who had teleported the Calamites to an unknown place were celebrated. They told the press that it was just part of their daily work, while the celestial body Sagittarius, a protector of Korea, endured intense criticism from the public. Those interviewed publicly attacked Sagittarius, saying he couldn't even protect his own family, 
labeling him as incompetent and unworthy of trust. Hugo Otters had to apologize publicly and visit the memorial for the victims. He stood in the rain for an entire day, but public opinion continued to criticize him relentlessly. The curses and shouts from the victims' families echoed behind him, their attitudes as if they wanted to tear Hugo Otters apart, but he did not respond with a single word. Stephen angrily shouted, Damn it, and turned off the TV. It's so annoying, I can't watch anymore. Yang Wai sneered. I think it's quite interesting. Stephen and Sophie retorted, they're unfairly pushing Sagittarius. But, in Yang Wai's eyes, it was a matter of course. The people needed someone to take responsibility, and in his selfish mind, he only wished for the scandal to grow larger to expand his influence. Laughter erupted from the staircase as a man holding a strong drink descended teasingly. Stephen Maker, you were smiling brightly in the photos yesterday. Why is your conscience starting to prick today? Avin Kruger, the bull saint, laughed loudly. It's only natural that the poor Sagittarius is being criticized. The dim-faced man grinned in delight. If that guy had any capability, he wouldn't need other saints to help. From behind, Jean Louis heftily added, You have to be accurate. That Sagittarius is worthless. Now blood fog has taken away half his power. The two burst into hearty laughter, forcing Stephen and Sophie to pull each other outside, unable to listen any longer. Both knew that after this, Hugo Otters would definitely be in trouble, and they had no idea what to do about it. Stephen sighed. I thought you'd be really happy. Usually, you hate Ji Wu, so why the strange reaction? Sophie pouted. I still hate Ji Wu, but I don't want terrible things to happen to her. The two fell into deep thought. What had just happened was truly bad, but there was no turning back. Above all, Stephen knew that no one would be more heartbroken than the children, especially Sung Jae, who had to witness his parents in this situation. Under the heavy rain, three members of the Sagittarius Zodiac walked between two rows of reporters waiting to capture the news. They requested Hugo Otters to share his thoughts, but every question drilled deep into, do you feel guilty? Hugo Otters kept his head down as he walked, ignoring the microphones pointed at him. He did not respond, even when there were rumors that all the victims had been taken to the Scorpius Hospital to cover up the truth. The president of Sagittarius simply announced that Hugo Otters would explain everything at the press conference, and then all three disappeared behind the iron door, still not looking up. Hugo Otters asked Yurin, where is Zhao Wan? Yurin replied that he had been transferred to the hospital, but was the last crew, just before the Calamites encountered him. The monster had thrown up the victims he could not swallow. Yurin expressed regret for having saved the captain in the end. Hugo Otters simply said, make sure to transfer him to this hospital, because Scorpius lent it to us. Unable to endure this indifferent attitude any longer, Yaren shouted, You don't need to take all the blame upon yourself. You have lost your family and fought against the Calamites until the end. Why do you remain silent and not tell the world what happened? Finally, Hugo Otters replied, There is indeed a way to save the victims in blood fog, but how would their families want to hear it? That their loved ones aren't dead, only their souls have been taken. Mentioning the need to capture blood fog is no different from a vain promise to torment them. Hugo Otters knows the public needs more than just an explanation, but he has almost lost all of his power to blood fog and has no choice but to let the saints send it to an unknown place. He turned away and added, No saint would want to trade their power and soul to restore the souls of their loved ones for the victims. Yurin was unwilling to accept this, trying to salvage the situation as she was heartbroken to see Sagittarius being despised while he had done nothing wrong. As she began to tremble and sob, Hugo Otters gently said, They are right to hate me. It's because I was weak, unable to protect them, unable to keep my promise to safeguard the country. Hugo Otters smiled like a dead man. Thank you, Yerin, for worrying about me. But there is nothing joyful in that. Yerin wanted to find more words to say, but a man's hand rested on her shoulder, shaking his head vigorously, telling her not to follow Hugo Otters anymore. The Saint Master sent the victims to the hospital instead of organizing a funeral, because he believes they can wake up at any moment. It's just that there is no way to do that now, but he hasn't given up. The moment you stop hoping is when you give up on the lady and Captain J1. Hugo Otters quietly arrived at the door of room 808, where his wife's name was. His hand was about to open the door, but paused when he heard his son calling for his mother from inside. The child's sobbing apology pierced Hugo Otters' heart. Sung J lowered his head, blaming himself for being so loud about being hungry. If all three of us had left the airport at that time, my mom and Uncle J1 would have been fine. The boy hugged his knees, repeatedly saying the words, if only, to himself while crying pitifully, tears and mucus streaming down incessantly, the sounds of apologies and calls of Ma. His son's cries pierced Hugo Otter's heart, leaving him helpless. Finally, he succumbed, unable to contain deep pain and sorrow as he cried bitterly outside the hospital room. In hindsight, he should have told Sung Jae not to blame himself because it was not the boy's fault. 
but every time he intended to speak, tears welled up, preventing Hugo Otters from saying anything. Hugo Otters did not want Son Jia to see his father's breakdown. The story by the campfire from Castellan made the mercenaries cry all their tears away. Jian, looking blank, hesitantly asked, Should I not have asked about that? Hugo Otters replied, It's been ten years, so it's okay to tell the story. It was just that Hugo Otters was frustrated because he had just come home from work when he was asked to tell the story. Not to mention the little deputy was crying as if it were real. Anyway, since Blood Fog was back, it was time to settle old debts. Hugo Otter's eyes were filled with determination as if he had already prepared a plan in his mind. This time he had to eliminate it once and for all. He looked at his friend and confidently said, I will do it. Inside the eastern city occupied by the Calamites, a transformed frog placed its broad feet on the ground, directing its bulging eyes to scan the surroundings. It stiffed the power of the sun god and the serpent god approaching. Holding the lump on its head, Blood Fog was ready to wait for them to come to take its life. Its roots were buried deep in every nook and cranny. This time, returning, humanity and the city would certainly not be at peace. The elite forces of Centauri, after finishing their chat by the campfire, dispersed to deal with the Calamites. Hugo Otters was leading with great enthusiasm, determined to burn them all before heading home. A subordinate whisper, handing Hugo Otters a can of soda as another person came to call the Holy Master. Have some chocolate, it'll help with the fatigue. Just as he lifted the candy in his mouth, someone else came to call the Holy Master, offering food like fans giving gifts to their idol. In no time, Hugo Otter's hands were overflowing with candy and snacks. These kids seemed to feel sorry for him because of the hardships he faced in the past. But no matter how he asked, they always said it wasn't true. While he would just have to take all the gifts and whatever he couldn't eat, he would let Jun have. He stuffed the whole box of chocolates into his mouth when suddenly he heard Larry Queen's voice echoing in his ears. She was using her psychic abilities to tell a story about Sung Jia and casually reported that he had currently used his teleportation portal to go to the secret library. Thanks to Larry Queen's identity as the Fairy Queen, no one had discovered that someone had illegally trespassed. Earlier, to convince Larry Queen to help him, Sung Jia had to admit that what he wanted to find in the magical archives was the skill to summon beings from another world, called Summoning Spirit. Although he had decided to give up on Gemini, that was only a temporary reason for Sung Jia to stay in this holy society. Once he had the summoning spirit skill, he would be allowed to summon entities from another world. More importantly, Sum J wanted to summon the souls of his mother and uncle J1, who had been bedridden for 10 years to protect him. Not to mention the innocent people who lost their souls that day, Sum J wanted to bring them all back. Larry Queen quietly listened to the child present his reasons for a while, then waved her hand to reopen the teleportation door directly into the secret archives. As soon as he saw the notification that using Larry Queen's identity, had successfully granted him entrance. Sung Jae cheered with excitement. Although she didn't ask much, just advised him not to try too hard, Sung Jae had already decided in his mind not to waste this opportunity. As soon as he entered the library, he reached out and grabbed the grimoire of the World Tree SS level, requiring 187,000 contribution points. At the moment, he only had a little over 157,000 points. Knowing he was sure on points, Sung Jae offered the bracelet his sister gave him to contribute to the Holy Association in exchange for the 30,000 points needed to rent the magic book. Once he successfully rented it, the knowledge within the book automatically flipped open and poured into his mind without needing to read. Sung Jae quickly wanted to read more carefully the part about summoning spirits and the section on communicating with the deceased, but digesting that amount of knowledge would take some time. He didn't realize that someone was lurking behind him. The book in his hands was suddenly snatched away by a golden light, falling into the hands of someone who had been waiting for this opportunity for a long time. As soon as he saw the face of that person, the son of Libra, Song Jae let out an annoyed scream. Yu Shi Wu flashed a cunning smile and deliberately asked, Why didn't you show up during the Gemini meeting, but now you're here? With no time to argue, Song Jae yelled out, Damn it, give me back my book. However, Shi Wu was not an easy guy to deal with. He played a trick, creating three different copies and pretending to ask, which one do you need? Sung Jae was going crazy. This bastard doesn't know what limits are. He produced even more copies of the book, grinning and sarcastically asking, you think you're tough because you have Lee Jun backing you up, right? But surely Shi Wu wasn't lurking around here without having the upper hand. He pulled out a necklace with the image of the Ligra scale, declaring, your old man and you are about to be torn apart. Hugo Otters raised his glowing bow, aiming straight at the night sky, firing a signal to call the troops back. The soldiers, eager not to toil in the dead of night, immediately gathered together to take roll call for the return. Tina reported in having enough members present. Team B also returned quickly, 
but Team C remained forever silent among the roots sprawling on the ground. Suddenly, the familiar sound of someone crying for help rang in the ears of Commander Sagittarius. The abandoned area was filled with mixed cries, the atmosphere sinking deep into despair. Jian was not greatly affected, but when he looked over at his friend Tixu, he saw his friend gritting his teeth, hands gripping the bow so tightly that the veins were bulging. Looking up once more, Jian saw Tixu's whole body ablaze like a torch. He had to gently remind, Take it easy, buddy, you're exerting too much power right now. Keeping a cool head is what's important. Realizing he was overdoing it, Hugo Otters ruffled his hair, trying to pull back the flames radiating from him. Jian stood up, stretching as he left his seat with the elite Sagittarius unit, preparing for whatever was about to come. In the urban area of Belgium, filled with metals and logos of Virgo, the people suddenly noticed a thin mist appearing from nowhere. The leaves turned red, resembling autumn, but just for a second, the roots of the trees began to emerge, writhing and thrashing, creating loud noises that caught the attention of Hugo Otters. Hugo Otters glanced over and was surprised to see that the roots were coming from inside the arch. The roots were also curling behind Hugo Otters and Jun, then giant clusters of roots jabbed sideways, penetrating the ground, stirring everything up. Soon after, a gigantic calamites jumped out of the ground, looking no different from a mastiff frog. Everyone quickly scattered in different directions to avoid its reach. Only Jian raised a leg and stomped directly onto the creature's snout as a greeting, using his foot instead of his hand, quite crude. But that was how he wanted it. Are you a wretched thing that made my friend and my grandson cry? Of course, the frog did not answer. Instead, it kicked Jian away 10 meters. But suddenly, from his foot, he realized that the monster was not resisting at all. Rather, it was wearing the delighted smile of a trapper. Jian's right leg was tightly wrapped by a tentacle, causing his blood vessels to burst, blood flowing freely onto the ground. He felt no pain. Instead, he muttered, You're not exactly cheap, are you? Inside the secret library, the blonde-haired Shi Wu raised his grandmother's artifact. It flashed with blinding light, causing Song Jia to stare wide-eyed. He clearly saw the image of the blood fog creature, with its mouth wide open, ready to devour Jen. The past crashed back in, intertwining with the present, leaving Song Jia frozen in shock, defenseless against Shi Wu's maniacal laughter. He was convinced that today, Song Jie's father and uncle would surely die. There, Jian was helpless with his leg ensnared, listening to the frog creature babble. I demand your power or your energy. Jian smiled as if this was the most ridiculous thing in the world. The tentacles wrapping around him suddenly burst into flames instantly. Glancing at his friend who had just shot an arrow, Jian laughed. Hey, check out this monster. It thinks everything in front of it is food. He lifted the leg being squeezed by the tentacle, then stomped it down hard to activate his super regeneration skill. From the shattered bones to his charred skin, clear signs of healing were evident. The only thing that had turned to, ripped pants, was his outerwear. Jin pulled the hammer artifact from his storage, telling the monster, Do you think touching me is that easy? You think you could have a nice meal? Jan pointed at the blood fong's face, shouting like a villain about to knock out the protagonist, Watch your greedy belly, I'll carve you open completely. As he finished the sentence, he propelled himself upward, swinging the hammer that emitted waves of energy. The amplification skill caused the hammer to enlarge by dozens of times, perfectly sized to smash down on the head of the blood fog, hoping it would die instantly. But under the weight of the hammer, only the monster's skin peeled off slightly. The blood fog roared, throwing both Jun and the hammer away. At that moment, an arrow shot from somewhere and struck its eye, followed by dozens of golden arrows raining down on the body of the Calamites all at once. It was Hugo Otters, effectively supporting his friend. He waved for his subordinates behind him to draw their bows once more. What they fired were not arrows from the centaur's skill, as the blood fog specialized in absorbing the energy of constellations. From the very beginning, the centaur army had used holy arrows taken from the weapon storage. Each person raised their bows high, knocked three arrows, and released the strings, sending them soaring directly into the blood fog. It had to endure pain from this barrage of arrows, but quickly used its tentacles to dig up rocks and dirt, creating a shield for itself. As it saw the people jump to avoid it, its sharp-tipped tentacles shot out, aiming to skewer everyone above. Jian had already recognized that these roots were indeed troublesome. He glanced around and propelled himself forward. This time, he didn't target blood fog, but attacked instead. He summoned Lime to play rock-paper-scissors with it. Lime's eyes turned into the shape of scissors, looking a bit ridiculous, but when it opened its mouth, it became clear that this was incredibly cool. It looked like a knife, but it was actually two halves of scissors in the hands of Gardner Jin. He suddenly found the job of trimming ornamental plants quite relaxing. Blood Fog jumped back upon seeing someone about to cut the roots that were sucking its nutrients, but John's speed was too fast. With both hands holding the two halves of the scissors, he swiftly cut through the roots right before the monster's blank stare. 
Even Lime struggled to keep up with his master's speed. He rolled, executing a twisting scissor skill, and sliced the ugly frog with hundreds of cuts in one go. Then he landed gracefully. Lime couldn't handle the leftover mess and got dizzy trying to keep pace with Jun, ultimately giving up. He continued his journey, relentlessly dismantling the ugly frog. Before long, it collapsed right in front of Jun and the chaotic centaur crowd. Had he already defeated it? Everyone knew it was the work of hero Lee Jun, but it seemed easier than anyone had expected. Only Hugo Otters felt something was off. This terrifying monster couldn't possibly be finished off so easily. The city's abnormal phenomena, specifically those grotesque bending trees still standing to absorb nutrients, indicated that it couldn't be over yet. Sonjay saw his uncle in the library defeating the Calamites, and he couldn't help but cheer in celebration. His face was flushed with pride. Only Shi Wu was surprised and he shouldn't underestimate his uncle. However, this kid had such an upper hand in the situation, it wasn't too surprising. He also announced that the battle hadn't even started yet. Hey, do you know why Blood Fog is so crazily hungry? He shook the chain on his wrist, making Son Jia feel a sense of danger approaching, especially when this kid emphasized that the Calamites could transform anything edible into power. Chi Wu shook his chain, the power of Libra somehow illuminating the core of the Calamites, reviving all the parts that Li Jun had damaged. The centaur group was shocked. Holy shit, it's regenerating. Blood Fog shoved its horns back into the grotesque mold, but behind it, there was something even more terrifying. Hugo Otters gaped as he saw the boundary of Virgo being eroded by Blood Fog. With Lyra in hand and an indifference to the world, Li Jun swung his arm to smash the rocks, revealing what lay beneath the ground. Just as he had predicted, countless thick roots twisted below, used by the Calamites to indirectly penetrate the boundary. Its scream was horrifying, like the sound of a sacrifice. The centaur squad had no time to hesitate. Alert, they raised their weapons as the frog stomped its front foot down hard. It seemed to go crazy with hunger, muttering, Food, food, I need more to eat. Its eyes sparkled as it looked toward the distant city, the craving for the human flesh there making Shi Wu laugh maniacally. Even Blood Fog needed time to consume a whole city, but with the barrier down, it would only take a moment. Song Jie, feeling dark and bewildered, knew that the stinking frog was about to leap into the crowded city. The blonde boy was thrilled. He saw it as an extravagant buffet compared to the people at the airport, struggling to find his words amid the laughter of the blonde. Song Jie touched his face and asked why he spoke as if he had witnessed the event at the airport. The memory from when he was seven suddenly surged back as he looked across the rows of seats and saw two strangers arguing at the airport about losing something and then scrambling to flee. The guy on the left was terribly familiar, yet Sung Jack couldn't recall. Was it really this bastard? He paled when he exclaimed, you caused that disaster back then, didn't you? And yet, in response, the blonde brat blurted out with a grin, what a fool, finally realized it. I've been bored to death hiding it for 10 years. The arrogant look on that insufferable face showed no remorse. Shi Wu laughed maniacally. Congratulations, you've landed on the jackpot square. It's me, the one who caused the incident at the airport. What are you going to do? Call the cops to arrest me or want to live stream for the whole world to hear? Song Jie was left speechless in front of this madman, yet he kept provoking. The son of Libra is the culprit. Who dares to touch him? My mother Libra is the strongest zodiac sign, understand? He howled with delight. Who would dare do anything to the son of the Saint Libra hiding behind his mother's shadow to commit such heinous acts? Song Jie could only feel rage. How could this guy have the heart to kill innocent people? In the eyes of this privileged brat, a thousand lives meant nothing. Why should he be afraid? The arrogant words made Song Jie furious, pulling out the dagger of Genis, successfully scaring the idiot into losing his nerve. Fortunately, he still would have fear his uncle's weapon. He was still panicking, remembering the scene where Li Jian crawled out, the familiar light blinding him. Shi Wu squinted tightly, then screamed when he saw a head full of hair emerge right under his armpit. But the red hair wasn't Li Jian's. It struck directly into the nose of the bastard. Even if he recognized Song Jie, it was too late. The kid exchanged his swollen head for Shi Wu's bleeding nose, knocking him backward, unconscious. He smiled mischievously. It was just ordinary magical light. The coward. The caster fell unconscious, causing the spellbook to drop loudly to the ground, giving Song Jie a chance to loot the items. Suddenly, his gaze collided with the Libra pendant that the spoiled young master held in his hand. He decisively snatched it away without saying much. This brat used the pendant to summon blood fog. Somehow, it could surely be used to eliminate the monster. Knowing that what he needed to do was to get to Europe in time for a moment, Song Jia hesitated, thinking about whether it would be useful since he had neither the divine relic nor the skills. Clutching his fist tightly, he realized that worrying further would only waste time. 
His eyes brightened with determination as he decided to seize the grimoire of the World Tree. He wanted to borrow its power to teleport to the desired location. Without the Gemini Badge, it couldn't be done, so he would use the power of this Zodiac Spellbook to activate the teleportation skill. In the city where the shield had been removed, there was a loud explosion under the rain of arrows from the Centaur team, who were doing their best to destroy Blood Fog. An arrow shot forth, spreading out into hundreds of arrows that obscured the light of the sky, a rain of arrows piercing into the monster that was desperately trying to use tree roots to shield itself, unable to lift its head out. Once again playing the role of a diligent gardener, Jian skillfully executed a trimming move with his powerful arm, working at full speed. As he approached any part of the monster, he would trim that section immediately. Without saying much, his cuts cracked the buildings and earth around him, enough to pierce through the body of the fat frog, which was on the verge of collapsing under the fierce attack. Meanwhile, the master pretended to be proud, praising himself for delivering such a beautiful blow. Suddenly, the ground right beneath Li Jun's feet began to stir. The roots of the abomination shot up in an instant, piercing through his left arm. His eyes filled with rage as he looked down at the cool part of his shoulder, allowing the super regeneration to restart. However, the blood mist that Blood Fox summoned seemed to be the nemesis of Jian's abilities. He had only one more chance to regenerate left. Jian stood there, with his arm gradually being enveloped by the light of the Ophiuchus constellation, frowning at the hardened tentacles. The burrowing head emerged right above him as bright golden light radiated dazzlingly. It was Hugo Otters plunging his whole body into the gap between his friend and the Calamites, delivering a strike that scattered them wildly. Just as his friend landed, Lee John's left arm had fully recovered. He clenched his fist from behind Hugo Otters, channeling all his strength into a sweeping punch that blew away all the writhing roots and shattered the Calamites. He had a moment to assess the situation. Both of them realized the source of power that brought the monster's essence together, which was similar to the power inside the Demon Tower as the army of red-ringed eyes kept attacking and then resurrecting. Twenty years ago, it was said that the Demon Tower was the scariest place because it was invaded by the army of red-ringed eyes. Humanity rumored that it was the secret base of an unknown civilization. But one thing was clear to everyone. The danger of the Calamites inside the tower was certainly at a higher level than the Calamites outside. Unlike the Spider Queen or the Calamites known as Hundred Thousand Arms categorized as Red Level, those inside the tower were even above Black Level, as they were extremely difficult to completely eliminate. At this moment, using his 13th sense to search for the enemy's weakness, Lee Jin had discovered three core nuclei glowing within the monster's body. One was in the middle of the tree mass on its back, one was a violent swirling fire in its belly, and the last, smaller one resembling the strongest core at the top, was meant to imprison the souls and lives of those it had swallowed. His eyes spotted the roots extending, luring souls from somewhere. He guessed it was from the central city where the blood fog had just lifted the barrier. Dan and John needed to report immediately to Hugo Otters to inform him that everyone there had passed out and the city had to be dealt with to prevent this monster from absorbing nutrients. He reached out to the Centaur team, urging everyone to shoot directly at the city to destroy the roots. But Blood Fog is a brainy Calamites. It immediately knows their plan. Therefore, it tightly wraps its roots around the group of Centaur people. Over at Hugo Otters, he is using fire to burn them, rescuing his subordinates. Jim is also busy tearing them apart with his bare hands. The terrifying scream of blood fog is like a horn calling forth the red and purple orbs scattered among its roots. Countless faces emerge from it, moaning and crying for help. The screams create chaos in the atmosphere and terror creeps into the minds of the centaur team until they are unable to resist at all. Please, the souls clinging to the team members groan, making them feel horrified. Seeing this, Hugo Otters felt anger rising within him. They were not souls, they were the tricks of that damned Calamites. In the hazy mist creating illusions, everyone sees that tragic scene. Even Jian couldn't help but curse. The nonchalant look of the frog disgusted him. It really knows how to drive people mad. He decided then and there that he must tear this monster apart. The smug face made Jian want to vomit. In the quiet sky of the city, a spatial vortex of Gemini suddenly appeared, dropping the red-headed kid Sung Jia onto the treetops. He hit the ground with a wail. The Libra necklace conflicted in power with Gemini, causing it to automatically change direction. The boy couldn't land properly and suddenly emitted a strange light and crackling sounds from Sung Jae's hand. He followed the direction it pointed and discovered that the bizarre thing he had fallen onto was a large, deformed tree entwined with grotesque roots. Its canopy emitted a languid red mist. However, Sung Jae did not yet realize he had landed in the right place. Believing that this city was still protected, the Libra necklace lit up, creating an effect that prevented the influence of blood fog. Sung Jae looked around for a moment and concluded that he had indeed landed in the right spot. 
The tree's roots were wrapped around many unconscious people. As long as they were still breathing, there was hope, especially since this was just the beginning. Holding a spellbook, Song Jae called upon the power of the magic tome and summoned the fire sorcerer deity from his skills, preparing to regard this tree as an enemy. Soon, the commotion in the western part of the city attracted reporters. But when the cameras rolled in, all that was left was a scene of desolation and ruin. The representative from the European Union screamed in frustration, that Dan Shi Wu, he has no idea how to work calmly. The issue that all of Europe wanted to keep quiet is now out of the open. Indeed, reporters revealed that the blood fog, which had appeared in the past, was the prime suspect in this attack. News reaches everywhere in the world, and the emotions of the viewers are of all kinds. From Libra, who frowns upon seeing the scoundrel met 15 years ago, to Moore, who happily sips a chilled coffee with a smile, or Larry Queen and Hygiene at home, anxiously watching television. When the reporters sent a drone inside, they saw a leg and torn pants dart away with a massive contraband in hand. Lee Jian, clad in his usual tattered outfit along with his centaur team, spent hours cutting through the tangled roots. They followed him like a tempting prey that wouldn't let go. As Hugo Otters stood below, yelling for his friend, the noise was so loud, he was about to receive a kick to the face. Hugo Otters suddenly had to brace himself with all of his might to withstand the blow. The legendary spider silk artifact, which was supposed to be a powerful barrier, was broken in an instant. Hugo Otters lost the ability to resist and was crushed to the ground, spitting blood. Gian flying above saw his friend in danger and became furious, kicking out his frustration on the roots. Looking back for just a moment, he fell straight into the painful emotional trap broadcasted live by the Calamites. In an instant, he froze, tangled up by several tentacles. With his face close to that thing simulating a vengeful spirit, Gian cursed inwardly. Now he understood the disgusting feeling of those forced to witness this horrendous sight. The frog grabbed by him was hurled from the rooftop down to the ground, smashed to bits. The centaurs who had just escaped the tentacles wrapping around them tilted their heads back and called out loudly, but saw no one, only the fiery red eyes of blood fog looking at the weak humans waiting to be devoured. Without Li Jian and Hugo Otters, the centaur brigade struggled to resist blood fog. However, suddenly, it felt a terrible pain ringing in its head and glared and turned to look toward the city to the west, where food supplies were stored, gritting its teeth in frustration. There was some dog over there disturbing the ancient tree. The pain became more and more pronounced, causing it to jerk with agony as Sun Jay's mage continued to punch the vile tree, hitting it with all the hatred mixed with frustration. Sun Jay yelled out that it was for things like this, for these kinds of things that his beloved mother could no longer smile that his father lost half his power and the world turned its back, that Uncle Jia Won was swallowed right before his eyes, along with the helplessness of watching innocent people lying around. All of it transformed into a colossal force for Sun Jia to strike directly into the damn logo and that wretched tree. Successfully destroying the ancient tree, the frog screamed in terror. Its eyes bulged out, cursing in all kinds of language, then ignoring a group of centaurs. It leaped over their heads and headed toward the city to the west. Each stomp of its foot splashed dirt, causing the whole team to realize something unusual was happening that made it so desperate to get there. Thanks to its change of direction, Hugo Otters was finally able to crawl out from the deep depression into the ground and stand up. He shouted loudly, asking for someone to hold the items he had prepared earlier. He closely followed Blood Fog, who was using a teleportation skill back to the city. As soon as it touched the ground, an arrow pierced straight into its head, causing excruciating pain. The pain paralyzed Blood Fog, and it let out a roar in agony. Unable to turn back to look at Hugo Otters, who had just released his grip from the bow. Until now, he hadn't dared to interfere with Jian for fear of obstructing his path. Now, he took out another spirited gift to the mutated frog. Hugo Otters prepared this super sacred artifact specifically for blood fog on his bow. He roared, Today, I will pin your fat body to the ground and make you into fried frog. Boom. The spear struck blood fog's left thigh and another pierced its right thigh, pinning it to the ground. The centaur squad seized the opportunity to open fire continuously from both sides, unleashing everything using the sacred artifacts. Every shot released numerous arrows along with binding ropes that tightened around it. Filled with hatred, it glared at the small beings holding the ropes to keep it down, but for now, it couldn't do anything. They had to use all their stamina-enhancing skills, keeping their eyes tightly closed and holding onto the rope together. This damned monster easily recovers from injuries. Right now, the only way is to confine it so it can't cause any more trouble. It roared, cursing the insects around. After experiencing unbearable pain from the nerves connected to the ancient tree, feeling helplessly pinned down while Son Jia was smashing everything, he now gathered all his strength for a final blow. Despite the energy notification, Libra and Gemini were counteracting each other, 
All the resentment accumulated over 10 years was released through this move. The S-Rank Fire Sorcerer used the combined power of the two zodiac signs to smash the tree into pieces. The protective shield was so thin that it cracked wide open. With its mouth wide open, pierced by the tree's spike, Blood Fog screamed in fear and desperation, arguing that the city would provide energy for it to explode into pieces, escaping the red mist, but where would it find souls to absorb? The souls screaming atop the roots of the tree vanished with the passing breeze, restoring peace to the minds of the centaur army. Song Jae lay amidst the wreckage he had just destroyed, fainting, and after a while, he slowly opened his eyes. Beside him was the fire sorcerer, thoroughly wrecked and drained of energy from the last attack. His whole body ached, wanting nothing more than to lie down. Suddenly remembering the ancient tree he had destroyed, he raised his head and seeing it shatter, finally felt at ease to lie back down. Sung Jae's hand gripped the Libra pendant as if it had been burned, charred, and swollen to the point of paralysis. He didn't know if it was because he had exerted himself so much against the tree or not, only that the holy artifact of Libra was gone as well. Well, at least he had done everything he could. Now, Sung Jae could finally enjoy the real sky after the archway disappeared. It felt unexpectedly joyful. He had succeeded. Just as he was happily smiling for a few seconds, Sung Jae's eye reflected a massive column of fire just outside the city shooting straight up into the sky. It exploded with a terrible force like a nuclear bomb. Any apostle would receive the notification that the power of the sun god Apollo is being activated. It swept directly toward the city, fast enough that Sung Jae braced himself for impact. Thanks to the serpent scale shield of the holy artifact Jenner activating automatically when danger was near, he could escape the stream of fire with its terrifying heat sweeping over the city. Sung Jae, standing within the barrier, had to brace himself just to stay upright, but it was reaching its limit and soon disappeared. The residual heat left Sung Jae utterly exhausted, a sensation that felt both like his father's fire and strangely unfamiliar. The devastation before his eyes was unbelievable. All the buildings had been hit by the wave of heat, as if they had been poured into lava. The spot where the Semtor army stood crackled with burning sounds, and they trembled, as if their ancestors carried the weight just to survive this ordeal. But it was not. It was the celestial sovereign Hugo Otters who gathered all his strength to protect the entire group. Now in a battered state, his arms were severely burnt. But what infuriated him the most was that the blood fog was using the stolen power of the Centaur as if it was its own. The flames burned away all the bonds of the sacred energy that Hugo Otters had struggled to set up. Fortunately, their commander was still alive, but the captain did not have as much strength as Hugo Otters, so after protecting his subordinates, he had no fighting power left. With no time to pay attention to the people who had just tied him up, Bloodfog's eyes glinted with malice, scanning the city, searching for the solitary human near the place where its ancient tree had been destroyed. Sung Jia recognized it as the Eye of the All-Seer, a centaur skill that his father often used, but this source of energy was completely different, truly unfamiliar. The monster identified Sung Jia as the one who had disrupted its source of power, and Hugo Otters also immediately recognized that the teenager was his son. He couldn't understand how he had ended up here. Let's not say he was the one who destroyed the dome. Hugo Otters guessed correctly, and Blood Fog let out a piercing roar, demanding to devour him whole. The little boy was just satisfied. He stamped his feet hard on the ground, his mouth ablaze, his eyes filled with fury as he leaped towards Sung Jae with the astonishing speed of a fat frog. As Sung Jae turned back to see the source of the noise, he was startled to see a horrid frog leaping towards him. Exhausted after punching a tree, he could only cover his head and scream like a bystander. He was sure this trip would end in death. That Hugo Otters appeared, using his body to block the creature's mouth just in time to save his son. Sung Jae yelled out as he recognized his father coming to his rescue. Meanwhile, Hugo angered Blood Fog, opening its mouth wide. His strength was not enough to suppress the creature, which only hurled insults at the cheap amateur archer. Its mouth grew wider, pushing back against Hugo Otter's muscular frame. Noticing the situation was dire, he gritted his teeth and turned to look at his son, activating the barrier, which surrounded Sung Jae, at least keeping him safe for the moment. As for himself, Hugo was bitten by the fat frog, swallowing both him and the ground beneath into its digestive system. Once again, Sung Jae watched as a loved one was taken by blood fog, but the barrier did not allow him to do anything. Hugo Otters was dragged inside, colliding with the dirt and rocks, making him feel faint. The fat frog became even more enraged, snapping repeatedly at the concrete below, pausing only after two or three more bites to ensure he had done enough. Sung Jae's hope dwindled, his desperate calls for his father going unanswered. The fire barrier activated automatically, even in the absence of its owner. It would not let Sung Jae surrender a danger. He just burst into laughter, ha <laughs> ha. 
I've just devoured the entire power of the sun god. Jian's scissors flew in from somewhere like a boomerang with a target. Two blades cut straight through the ugly frog's face, sliding along its rough skin, gliding smoothly. Jian crashed into the block of wood above the Calamites, desperately trying to find his friend, only to be met with his triumphant laughter, yearning for more power from the constellation of Fuchs. Blood Fog charged straight towards Li Jian, who was tearing through rocks and dirt. He was infuriated and used his 13th sensibility, seeing his friend falling into the monster's stomach. Jian shouted, but he couldn't hear anything. Hugo Otter's subconscious floated vaguely as his body fell freely inside the monster's belly, filled with regret. Hugo Otters always tortured himself for not being able to stake his wife and subordinates. Blood Fog was still very much alive, and all he could do was expose the misery for Sung Jia and Yoa to see. Could everything really end like this? Suddenly, a blinding light pierced Hugo Otter's cornea. He opened his eyes and saw the fragment of his power that had been taken from him was being held captive here. His hand reached towards that source of energy, silently thinking that if he could obtain it, he would surely have the strength to confront Blood Fog once more. But consciousness was gradually fading, and the tired body seemed to pull Hugo Otters down. In his mind, he wondered what he was trying to fight for. Was it because the memories of family were slowly fading in the mind of a loser? The photo of the whole family loving each other taken in the park meant more than just a memory to Ji Wu. Hugo Otters remembered his wife's excited voice and her gentle smile asking, What do you think? Doesn't our family look beautiful? No. Hugo Otters gritted his teeth and opened his eyes wide that were on the verge of closing tightly, struggling to break free from the binds holding him down. Hugo Otters was determined not to give up. He strained to reach it. Can I end like this? I cannot die in shame. I cannot meet my family and Jian again. I cannot let them see my weakness once more. I must, I absolutely must reach for it. The inner strength identified the fragments of the centaur and connected with them. It began with a small ray of light and the fragments of the sun recognized their master. It swirled fiercely like a fireball wanting to return. It was the source of Hugo's strength. The notification kept appearing, warning that the sun's fragments, having been in contact with cruel energy for too long, would result in certain backlash. But that was Hugo's lifeline, so he forced himself to take it on. His body could take no more. His hands felt like they were being burned, about to be unable to absorb any longer, when suddenly, the space above shattered. A loud cracking sound echoed, and a familiar figure dashed by. As soon as Lee Joan appeared, he growled with a scowl, Hugo Otters. His rough voice shouted angrily, You have so much to do, and you dare to hide your slacking off. His sturdy friend's hand spread wide in front of him urging Hugo Otters to grab it. The trademark scowl of his friend made him smile more joyfully than ever. He made a great effort to grasp the hand which he had leaned on over 30 years ago to get by. He was tossed back out. In Arabia, 30 years ago far away, there were calamites in the shape of centipedes, stirring up the earth and sky. Wherever they struck, the blonde young man was buried in sand. Crawling in the desert had never been Hugo Otters' hobby. He leaned over, retching violently, and before he could blink, he heard the sound of sand being forced up. The centipede flung the young man high into the sky and took a satisfying bite. The passage down the centipede's stomach was not as roomy as that of the blood fog frog. At that moment, Hugo Otters, submerged in the slimy enzymes, pondered his vague life, one without ever having married before dying, not to mention a life of poverty, no different from that of a beggar. Suddenly something pulled him sharply upward and the clear sky opened up before his eyes as someone had just sliced the centipede's head open to peek inside. Li Jian, 30 years ago, was filled with scars, mumbling, How can this man not be dead yet? He's already showing his defeated face. Hey, take my hand, little brother. Seeing the blonde guy stretch out his hand, Jian directed his cloudy gaze and grumbled back, What's up? Don't you want to leave here? From that moment on, the image of Li Jian in the eyes of Hugo Otters never changed. It was still the same frowning guy charging towards him, raising his hand, shouting his friend's name loudly, cursing and yelling, why aren't you coming out? And what are you still lying here for? The carefree attitude of that friend was what made Hugo Otters smile, because he always stood in front with a frown, but his hand would always reach out to pull him out of places thought to be dead. This segment resembled a romance novel until Hugo Otters was thrown outside, looking no different from a beaten up thief. Sung Jae was extremely panicked. His father had lost consciousness, no matter how he shook him, he would wake up. Jian activated his sixth sense, casting his gaze on his friend, realizing why he was absorbing the polluted sun fragments. But fundamentally, everything was still okay. Hugo Otter's body was undergoing a detoxification and purification of the contaminated power, which genuinely surprised Jian. This fool was regaining strength while inside the blood fob. He stood up, exhaled deeply, and comforted the little boy. It's just that your father ate something dirty. You'll be fine after a good sleep. 
Song Jiao, of course, didn't understand what his father had eaten in the belly of the frog, but his uncle didn't bother to explain further, simply stating, this level won't kill Hugo otters, just be careful. He then picked up the gardening shears and directed his gaze toward blood fob. Despite the massive hole he had drilled into its chest, it still didn't blame him for still having a job to do. Having finished his sentence, Jion soared straight up like a rocket, aiming right at the monster's snout, delivering a blow with the shears infused with his power illuminating the area brightly. Such a move didn't sever Blood Fog's head, but it was simple enough to embed the shears. Jin grinned with delight, reminding the writhing creature that it was exactly because of it that the whole world laughed at his best friend. My kid hasn't even had a proper birthday yet. As he spoke, he brutally pressed the shears down, determined to punish this ungrateful Calamites. It gritted its teeth, trying to resist the attack, but John had already soared away from its head, leaving behind a pair of shears that had yet to pierce through the skin. At that moment, the hammer artifact was purely logical and appropriate. Jian needed something stronger, so he struck the shears, unleashing a blinding burst of power, wanting to enlighten the monstrous creature. Blood fog screamed in pain, unable to believe it had been defeated by a human. It called the Seno Futures by name as if they were close, saying, I've lost this round, but I've already set up for the next one. My roots are everywhere in the city. As long as they are there, they will drag the whole crowd along. It struck hard at the struggling trees, causing the entire area to be utterly destroyed with the goal of crushing this city, burying all to allow the Saint of Fuchus to escape, but not others. It aimed at all the archers hiding throughout the city, especially at the half-hearted blonde who was lying around, causing several buildings to crash down on some Jia and his family, still trying hard on top of blood fob. Jian yelled, Hey, are you really that stupid? My friend Hugo Otters, no matter how gentle he is, isn't so easy going that you can do whatever you want. He let his poor nephew hug his father and cry out, thinking this was surely the end. Unexpectedly, just as Jian said, Hugo Otter's eyes gleamed with a bright yellow right before the pile of rubble came crashing down. A golden light flashed from the darkness and suddenly turned all the irreparable debris into nothing. The reporters lurking outside the scene, hundreds of kilometers away, were drawn in panic to look back at the light. The sky was pinch black, swirling violently, with the flames shooting up from the ground or perhaps descending from above. The councilman clutched the TV screen, looking utterly helpless, while those battle-hardened like Moraine surely recognized what it was. But from the TV screen, there was nothing to see but the terrifying light. But even that was enough for the others with their calculating minds to realize that a significant change was about to occur. In the middle of the night, the sky lit up as bright as day, indeed a bizarre phenomenon. According to reporters, that day was like a sun rising. Yoma's footsteps thundered down the hallway as the girl burst into Haley's room, shouting urgently to deliver news. However, inside the room of the Saint Scorpio, she had been monitoring the situation since it began, not taking her eyes off it for a moment. She clicked her tongue and commented on behalf of all the saints watching after all the effort. It seems they're still trying to regain their lost power. Amidst the violently swirling sky, Hugo Otters still wore his tattered beggar's clothes but exuded the spirit of a god riding flames majestically. Sung Jia looked up at his incredibly cool father and felt immense joy. My dad woke up just in time and is perfectly fine. That's worth more than a perfect score. The extremely angry frog realized that the power it had long desired had suddenly vanished, leaving it very frustrated. It croaked loudly, launching its massive roots and everything it possessed reaching high and far, hoping to capture Hugo Otters above. All the minions of the burrowing frog rushed up, gathering into several writhing heaps that looked dreadful. Without the S-Class bow and arrows in hand, but with the current power of the Sun God, this troublesome mass of roots would immediately know to retreat with just a little light shining on them. A wide area damage blow like that had to be executed by Hugo Otters. Wherever the blinding light shone, the roots evaporated instantly. While nothing else was harmed at all, the skill Sky Radiance of the Sun and God Apollo seemed tailor-made for those damned roots. Soon enough, the several layers of towers they had formed disintegrated, evaporating with the wind. The diligent worker Li Jian switched to sculpting the monster's head, laughing gleefully. Sky Radiance is a skill that incinerates the filth of Hugo. Did you know that fat frog? You said you swallowed everything, didn't you? The more he spoke, the more fired up Jian became, his hands moving faster. If you want to steal anything from us, you better check if you can, because it's time to finish this. Who has time to dig holes all day? Activating his combat ability, Jian swapped places with the nearest person he had come into contact with. And, in an instant, the Saint Centaurus had stepped on the monster's head in place of his buddy. Jian hovered in the sky, shifting positions, then shouted the familiar name of the Fen Chua. Oh, Hugo Otters, hey, finish it off, my friend. He looked up in agreement with his friend, then lowered his hand to grip the wing to leave him behind and continue the job of piercing the Calamites, ignoring its noise. 
With each chop, old memories surfaced when Hugo Otters dared not touch the doorknob. In his ears, he heard the boy crying and begging for forgiveness, saying, If only I hadn't complained about being hungry back then. If only the three of us had left the airport right away, then Mom and Uncle Ja One would still be alive. And Dad, too, he would still have enough strength to suppress the Calamites. Everything would remain the same, right? The boy, Hugo Otters, wept bitterly at just seven years old, taking all the blame upon himself, leaving Hugo Otters choked up as if a stone was lodged in his heart. He pulled out the bow, wanting to shoot what had obstructed his path, softly reassuring his son. You are not at fault at all, some Jay. A holy arrow shot from the bow, radiating a terrible light enveloped by sky radiance, purifying all tainted power. Whether it awakened blood fog or not remains unknown, but this time it plunged, the ground chilled, creating a large crater as if a bomb had exploded. Remaining Hugo Otter sat to catch his breath for a few seconds when his farmer friend approached. I didn't expect this incident to end so chaotically. Hugo Otters wasn't sure what to do anymore. All the cores had been destroyed, his body reduced to ashes, so there was nothing more he could do. He cursed the damned blood fog that was bothering them. His friend joined in the cursing and Hugo Otters let out a sigh of relief. With a friend taking care of this calamites, it was much easier to bring it down. He closed his eyes and calmly said, Thank you, my dear friend. Seeing his friend's fist in front of him, Hugo said, Oh, come on, after all these years, is that all you have to say? It's been tough, my brother. The two gave each other a cool fist bump, and thankfully this time he didn't demand 50 kilos of fried chicken. But wait, John rummaged around and said he had found something interesting while fighting the blood fog. How strange, from his tiny pocket, he pulled out a huge glowing ore. He explained that this was the core he had obtained from that monster. Hugo Otters was amazed and had no idea what it was, and neither did Jin. Using his 13th sense and the eye of the god, he discovered that it was a soul-sealing gem, designed to imprison the souls of those who had been absorbed by Calamites. Channeling the power of the Ophiuchus constellation into the ore, cracks began to appear as it could no longer withstand the pressure. Once it was no longer whole, it lost its ability to imprison souls. Soon, beams of light burst forth, shooting straight up into the night sky. Hero Otters, Sue had a feeling he knew what it was, but he was still in disbelief, stunnily asking his friend, what is this? It was the liberation of the soul that had been swallowed by blood fog. One by one, my friends would be awakened. Sung Jay's voice came from behind, cheering loudly, is it really true, uncle? He ran over just in time. He was so out of breath that he asked again, can it really be awakened? Of course, the sphere gradually disappeared from John's hand. He confidently assured, I guarantee your mother will wake up too. Needless to say, the boy was deeply moved. The uncle asked another question. It's been a while since you had a proper birthday, right? Though it's a bit late now, under the sky filled with 1,000 souls finding their way home, Jan smiled brightly and wished his beloved nephew a happy birthday. Stephen Maker howled like a leading gorilla, I will never stand by and let humanity and the big bone be threatened by you. That was when he unleashed the thunderstorm skill, firing weapons that shattered the remaining Calamites' thousand arms on the beach, making the thugs widen their eyes and drop their jaws as they saw the lion saint descend. The severed tentacles looked like a superstar. Standing before the crashing waves and white foam, he raised his precious Big Bone high and roared, we've got it back. In Stephen's mind, Big Bone is as precious as a child that he carried for nine months and ten days. He feeds it, gives it water, and takes it for walks on beautiful days. Then, when the mosquitoes Li Jun and Sergeyevich come to cause trouble, Stephen will fight alongside his Big Bone to fend off the noisy group. Together, they will face fierce battles that make their hair stand on end side by side, feeling fulfilled. I have you, you have me. We have each other to make the world stare in awe. One night, while Stephen was sound asleep next to his beloved Big Bone, it nipped him and slipped out of his embrace, its eyes filled with anguish. It was the Paskiova that had snatched Big Bone away. As Stephen cried out desperately, Li Jian suddenly appeared from behind, grabbing his legs and swinging him around in the sky. He slammed Stephen's muscular body to the ground with a thud, waking him up and making him scream. Oh, my dear beloved bone, don't go. But there was no bone to be found. Stephen woke up in the intensive care unit with his head wrapped in bandages. Around him, a few of his underlings screamed in panic. One said, the sect leader has woken up. Don't you remember? While hunting, you were ambushed by Li Jian and ended up here. The group of subordinates was whispering, planning to explain what had happened. While Stephen was unconscious, but what was more important in his bandaged head that needed to be seriously addressed was, what is going on? The people swallowed hard, focusing on the strange attitude of the saint. They thought of bold statements like gathering everyone to attack Li Jian and take revenge on Capricorn. But from Stephen's mouth only came, go get Chi on Yua's room and bring me the bone. The subordinates were disheartened. 
Castellan, can't you stop with the bones? The subordinates wanted to kneel and plead. Just go back to sleep so the world can be at peace. What time is it that you are still looking for bones? The noise echoed out into the corridor. The subordinates knew immediately that the saint was as healthy as a horse. They wondered whether they should report this to Deputy Commander Yua. Someone nearby immediately countered. Don't you see that girl shooting out like a missile when we had a mission related to Li Jun's eighth relic? Just thinking about that girl recklessly charging into the dangerous sanctum of Scorpio makes me speechless with her impulsive nature. One subordinate rushed in, breathlessly reporting to those who were still in the dark that the comatose individuals from the blood fog incident 10 years ago had finally awakened. The entire Scorpio hospital housed 1,000 victims from that shocking incident, so the fact that all 1,000 of them woke up alert turned the hospital into a buzzing hub. The news quickly turned this into a hot topic, coincidentally connecting with the European front. After the remnants of the prolonged battle between the hero Li Jun and the sage Sagittarius defeating Blood Fog, the whole world is discussing the connection between these two events as a miracle. Everyone is calling it a miracle that has never been seen before. In a luxurious room, someone was watching television from all over the world with an unhappy expression. Until the blonde guy appeared behind him, he still didn't turn around and continued to grumble. I can't believe it. Sending you to catch Jian and Hugo Otters was useless, and you even lost Blood Fog. Shi Wu silently listened as the guy cursed about losing the necklace that Celestial Body, his mother, had given him, while leaving blood fog in a noisy mess. Shi Wu's brother, Yu Ti Wu, suddenly turned around with a strong drink in hand, continuing to berate him for dropping the magic book and important things into the hands of the punk Sung Jie. He mocked Shi Wu for allowing someone who had been bullied to take the book right in front of him. He remained silent and endured, even when his brother yelled, You're just a stupid waste, only making him angry. He threw a bottle straight at Shi Wan's head, shattering it. Are you still proud of yourself, nodding your head, having done nothing useful at all? I realized that back at the airport. Ignoring his younger brother rolling in pain, Taewoo continued the insults. You are truly our mother's disappointment. So how do you plan to handle this mess, you idiot? He ground his shoes on Shi Wu's face, but the boy still didn't dare to resist, since he had come here to ask his brother for help to secure the middle boat. Since this incident was related to calamities, he had to help if he wanted to cover it up. His older brother was also freaked out by all this nonsense, holding his head and saying, Right now, follow Li Jian, keep an eye on him, and erase all traces left behind. Seeing Tai Wan calm down, Shi Wu, holding his face, clumsily got up and asked, What about my brother? Turning to look out the large window, Tai Wan decided to make a trip to the Fiend Yet Hospital. At least it could cover up the airport incident by caring for the victims in Korea. While they were scheming in the outskirts of the European defense line still enveloped in the dust of collapsed bricks, some people from Hugo Otters were looking quite tattered. The phone signal was still strong enough to hear news from afar. As soon as he hung up, he joyfully announced the news from the hospital. Except for Jia Wan and Ji Wu, everyone else has regained consciousness. Jian was not in a hurry. He knew that the longer a soul was trapped, the more time it would take to return to its original body. But when he released the soul, he had infused a bit of his power into it, so he just needed to wait. Looking at his nephew, Jian smiled and said, You need to go back to see your mom and uncle. After hesitating for a moment, Sung Jae opened his mouth to ask, What about the uncle? And what about dad? Sung Jae's face turned crimson. He didn't dare to look directly at the person he was asking about. However, Hugo Otters heard him clearly and was staring wide-eyed, deeply moved, wondering if that child was inquiring about him. To show that he was a father who knew how to respond to his child's feelings, Hugo Otters hesitated to select a few appropriate words from his long list of emotions. He only indirectly opened the subject, dad and uncle still have matters to settle. The boy had said okay, opened the magic book, and prepared to teleport back to South Korea. Jin grinned widely, laughing in his friend's face. The young boy's affection was quickly turned into a statue, and the autumn breeze brushed through his hair, so he had to speak up to comfort. The boy was just shy. Hugo Otters had to resign to this because there was nothing else to do. The Thenia Hospital was the destination for Sung Ja Na Hong. He was still wearing his clothes from the fierce battle of blood fog. Just as he tucked the book into his bag, he felt extremely nervous, his heart pounding. Inside, he was about to see his mom and uncle Jia Won again. But after taking just two steps, Song Jia suddenly remembered he was going to visit someone in the hospital without bringing anything along. He felt quite embarrassed. So he turned left, ran onto the street to find some flowers, and grabbed them to confidently visit. The intersection in front of the hospital became deserted after Song Jia left, not a soul in sight. Suddenly, the sound of shoes clattering along with grumbling and curses broke the silence. Ta Wan covered half of his face, criticizing the Thean Yet Hospital. Even if a thousand people stayed here for ten years, it would still be less luxurious than his Thin Bin Hospital. 
Standing there, rubbing his forehead out of frustration, Taiwan wanted to find some Jai right away to slap him and shut him up. But for now, he had no idea where he was. So he thought, why not go stir up some trouble for his family? They'll have to show up eventually. Meanwhile, some Jai was running back to the hospital with a bunch of fresh flowers, unaware that a rude person was waiting for him. One session after the sweep of blood fob, the area under the Western Dome was in the process of healing and cleaning up the battlefield. The elite forces of Nen Ma were considered to have made a significant contribution. Each of them, being interviewed for the first time, was nervously fidgeting. Nearby, voices called out, bringing the injured into the makeshift hospital, which had taken over a large building filled with masks and stretchers for the wounded. Sitting inside the counter, Li Jun was deep in thought, ignoring the noise in the lobby. Li Jun was reviewing his system boards and missions after successfully dealing with the blood fog calamites. His strength test had been completed. The reward was enhanced power after a day and the transformation of a human body into a divine body. In addition, Jan opened a new achievement recorded in his scripture. Sagittarius had seen and admired the master of the Ophiuchus constellation even more. The fact that he destroyed the demon and free human souls was also noted here. What Jin enjoyed the most was that thanks to opening Achievement 2, he could borrow the power of Sagittarius when the conditions were met. There were still a few days to complete the tasks related to the secretary and disciple, but for now, he had to set that aside as there was something more important to do, which was the twisted object that had been making him stare at it for a while. This was a fragment resembling that of a dagger discovered to be from the mysterious civilization that John had found in the sealed heart of blood fob. Before dying, that spinning top roared, I need those souls to offer to them. This made Jian quite certain that the one mentioned by Calamites and the one who stabbed him in the demon tower were the same. His fingers tossed the coin as he pondered why all the evidence pointed simultaneously to Virgo. Isn't it too coincidental? Forget it. Jian raised the coin high and grabbed it back with excitement. He was the type of person who, when faced with difficulties, would bypass them. Whenever he couldn't find an answer, he would just grab the person responsible and beat them up until they confessed. A moment later, next to his wine, there was an additional glass of draft beer. Hugo looked quite disheveled, his arms heavily bandaged from burns, but his spirits were relatively high. First, he had to advise his friend to rest more before seeking out Virgo. It wasn't too late. Jean growled angrily and scolded. These kids nowadays are so spoiled that they're weak. In my time, we didn't have the luxury of breathing. Calamities rained down all the time. He spoke as if Hugo Otters hadn't been born in that era. Just boasting and seeing Hugo Otters looking embarrassed, Jan switched topics to ask his friend, Why don't you go with Sung Jie to visit your wife and subordinates? When I meet those two, I don't feel confident or qualified. I need to prepare myself mentally. Hugo Otters frowned, There's still a lot to settle first. Looking at the debris on the table and the broken pieces in his hands, Hugo Otters knew he had to deal with both Libra's issues and Virgo's as well. Thinking of that woman who loved to play with everything golden, who liked to choose a chair as towering as a throne and sat down to act superior, Hugo Otters knew that blood fog was not the end. He had to find the root cause of the incident, especially when he heard his son mention that there was still someone manipulating things from behind. So what are you planning to do now? Jian asked, glancing over to receive his friend's brittle glass cluster. He said he would smash that person's skull, causing Jian to burst into loud laughter. Feeling happy, Jian suddenly spotted some Sagittarius kids that annoyed him and spoke up to drive them away. Go home, you kids. We are fighting against you because it's related to blood fog, but now it's over. You'll just get in the way while we catch Virgo. The whole group looked dejected because he was absolutely right and they couldn't argue back. Even though being called useless to their faces was tough, they accepted it. Suddenly, Jian pointed at the team leader, telling the kid with the gelled hair to stay which sparked jealousy around them. Truly SF level, different class. But only these two friends understood each other well. They needed Aaron Boy like J1 back then to act freely. Jian asked, Why did you let some Jag go back to Korea alone? Don't you see the danger? Hugo Otters jumped up immediately, realizing the seriousness of the issue. However, his relaxed expression revealed his preparedness. Who is it? Jian immediately raised the coin with the image of a Philipsis on it as an answer. I've been wanting to show this off, and now I finally have the chance. He pinched the coin between two fingers as if to say, look closely. Before Sung Jae could receive Jian's gift, the kid simply said, this is a gift from uncle, but his eyes flashed with loyalty level detection, recognizing the kid reverently possessed 300% of Fetch's loyalty, qualifying him to preach by offering a coin engraved with his zodiac sign. Jian silently accepted the kid as his disciple, having been assigned a separate mission by the system to earn a reward.